Paramount Plus has dropped the first three hours of its new miniseries, The Offer, about the making of the 1972 classic, The Godfather. As a biographical drama, the show primarily relies on the real-life account of its central character, producer Albert S. Ruddy, to disclose the gritty details behind the film's creation. On today's episode, we discuss the best and worst parts of the series so far, as well as the reaction from critics and audiences. It's Sunday, May 1st. Let's begin. Having just watched The Godfather for the very first time, did it hold up to the hype? Yeah, I definitely see why it's considered one of the best films ever made. It, like, I mean, when it comes down to either the acting or the script as a whole, or like even just the score, I think that like, it's it's amazing. Right? Have you had it ruined for you over all these no. years? No, thankfully I hadn't. I've had so many other films, like The Sixth Sense I've never watched because I already know what happens in that. And like other films I've always gotten ruined for me. Like, you had Game usually, of Thrones ruined for yeah, you. Yeah, Game of Thrones, Breaking Bad. My YouTube suggestions just come up with movie clips to like these famous movies that end up like giving away a major thing. But we'll stop watching watching trailers and that'll stop being suggested for you thankfully for the godfather yeah i didn't get anything ruined and i didn't i don't think i've gotten the second or third uh film ruined for me either so cool did it remind you of sons of anarchy at all sons of anarchy no not really because this is more it's more family centric but you had like the patriarch figure in ron perlman's character right yeah in the first season at least but i i saw it just more as kind of like the mafia movie in fact i have it it's very closely related, not only behind the scenes, but also just film-wise to Scarface. Oh, yeah. Film. I'm talking I'll about the ni- 1930s, actually. I, I haven't seen the 1980s film, but, like, the original that they did, directed by Howard Hawks. I have a spoiler for you. He snorts a lot of cocaine. Yeah, in the 80s version? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not in the 30s version? He doesn't snort any no, cocaine? There's no. no mountain of cocaine? There was a... The, yeah, there... I mean, the MPAA was completely different from the 30s to the 80s. So what was he snorting? He wasn't snorting a lot. There was just, like... It was just violent. Was Marlon Brando in that one too? No, it was Paul Mooney. (laughs) Okay. Um, So I have a game here to kick us off into the show. It's where you answer as many questions as you can in one minute. Okay. Yeah, we've done this before. I did awful at it last time, I remember. Well, then after that, we'll just go over them and see what the answers are. Now, they can be anything related to the show. They can even be opinion-based. So there's no necessary uh, right answer or wrong answer. All right, let's see. All right. Three, two, one. True or false, Miles Teller replaced Army Hammer to portray Albert... S. Ruddy. Uh, true. True or false? Coppola wasn't involved at all in the offer. Uh, false. What two shows did the offer remind you of? Oh, two shows? Um, actually, The Eddie and Winning Time. Name the title of any of the episodes. Oh, I don't, I don't remember. Uh, it was basically, I, I don't remember. Okay. Which of the first three episodes is the best? Uh, the first one. At Connie's wedding, what does Sonny do when an FBI agent flashes his badge? Oh, I forgot. I forgot. <laughs> you saw the movie like two days ago. I know, ago. I know, I know. I forgot. Okay, how many times is Don Vito Corleone shot in his assassination attempt? It's five or six. I think it's five. What rating do you think the offer has on IMDb? Like an 8.2. Cast members, Colin Hanks, Ross McCall, uh, Frank John Hughes, James Matteo, and Kirk Acevedo uh, were all part of what other series before the offer? I don't know. <laughs> the book is way more sexist or racist than the film. Which uh, yo, that, the book is way more sexist. Oh, sec- no, racist. Sorry, racist. That's your final answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we're out of time anyways. <laughs> All right. I have more questions. You got through, I think, about 10. Uh-huh. Let's go through them real quick. Okay. Miles Teller replaced Army Hammer to portray Albert The S. only Ruddy. reason I said true to that is because I remember in, like, the one, uh, like, a podcast we did a couple Gaslet? times ago. Yeah, Gaslit. I was talking about Dan how Stevens. Army Hammer. Yeah, yeah. Army Hammer to left to go to the <laughs> offer. Yeah. Well, yeah, and then he went from the offer to nothing. <laughs> so that was he, true. Yeah. It's weird, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. All right. Because that would have been the main character of both shows. Right. Mm-hmm. True or false, Coppola wasn't involved at all in the offer. That's actually true as well. Really? Because, I, yeah, I, I checked to see if he was still alive today, and I saw that he was. Yeah, and so was Ruddy. Hey, Ruddy's like uh, 92 years old. But Ruddy has something to do with this, right? Yes. He's he, the executive producer because they did that, that whole entire behind-the-scenes thing at the end of the episode, at least for the third one. Uh-huh. And I saw that he, like, was talking about it. So Most yeah. of all of this is based off interviews with him that Michael Tolkien did. Michael Tolkien made the show. Um, name the title of any of the episodes. Okay, first one is A Seat at the Table. Second one is Warning Shots. And the third one is Fade In. Yeah, 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 that all has to do with the uh, Italian mafia. Which of the first three is the best? 
I said the first one. Uh, I think that the first two, really, it's, like, neck and neck. I think that the first one just be beats it out because, like, the way in which they introduce all the characters. I Pilots found. do tend to, like, they put as much forward as they can. Well, yeah, they have to be, like, the most interesting so people keep watching. All right, so you're saying this is no different. Mm -hmm. The thing that Sonny does to the FBI agent is he spits on the ground. I would never have gotten that, yeah. Uh, I was going to make that a multiple choice and be like, did he punch him in the face? Did he? <laughs> but we only had a minute, yeah. Yeah. How many times did Don Vito Corleone get shot? You said five. You're right. He got shot five times. Yeah. All right. I, it was like four or six, four, four or five or six, and I was just one with the middle. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, Ross McCall, Colin Hanks, Frank John Hughes. Okay. Well, you were watching this. Did, didn't you recognize anybody? Oh, yeah. I mean, I recognize, well, I recognize them all from film. Like Don, Don, uh, what, Don But Fagel. any TV shows? Well, yeah. Don Fagel's from The Walking Dead. Mm, any before that? Not that I can't remember. All of the characters I named. One, two, three, four, five. Plus the director of the episodes that you watch, um, they all were in Band of Brothers. Oh yeah, and then Adam Arkin also directed the third episode of this. Didn't he have something to do with Band of Brothers? I thought he's done a lot of other shows. I know. So, well, yeah. he half directed it. He directed it with Dexter Fletcher, and along with being in Band of Brothers, Dexter Fletcher was also in Hotel Babylon, mm. which I saw him in. He's gotten old, like super gray over time. It's just crazy <laughs> to see how people. Some of them look kind of similar to what they did before him. yeah this guy he let his hair grow out he's just like colin hanks did it for like in the past couple of years yeah, he has not same. aged yeah. <laughs> all right the book is way more racist yeah no i knew that because yeah that's what like the whole entire mafia storyline in this show is about they don't like the fact that they're racist yeah or what? They, no they think that the godfather book is definitely racist do you want me to go through the rest of these questions or not uh yeah yeah all right having watched three hours what percentage do you think is true Oh, this was a question that I had. Um, I hope because it seems like a really interesting story, like 90%. Okay. Um, I'm going to actually delay the answer on that one. True or false, Hogan's Heroes was Albert Ruddy's first project in oh, the yeah. industry. Yeah, no, no, that's what they have in the show, yeah. Uh-huh. It's not actually true. Oh, okay. Yeah, from 1963, he was working on the Lloyd Bridges show. Then he was on this movie called Wild Seed, which was actually directed or pulled in by Ma Marlon Brando's father, That I think. makes a lot more sense because in this show, what it was was just like... um. Albert Ruddy, because he's at a party and he's friends with someone in at Paramount, is just able to somehow get the pitch. And I was like, well, that seems like a really easy way. It seems like he would have had to do more work than just to pitch Hogan's Heroes. Hollywood is all about the connections, though, so it's sort of believable. Who is the biggest antagonist of the offer? Of the offer? Oh, 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 I, I actually have something written down on this. I would say Robert Evans, because the first two episodes, he seems like a protagonist, like a pretty nice guy. And then by the third episode, you start to see kind of the turn in him a little bit. Like he starts to get really, really mad at the Godfather production because they're not doing exactly what they want him to. And what was Robert Evans like importance in the Godfather making? Oh, well, I mean, he's the executive of Paramount Pictures. So oh, okay. he, he's the person who's like, he, he stood up for it in the first two episodes being like, no, no, no this could actually work. I thought you were going to say Barry Lapidus. Oh, well, yeah, Colin I mean, Hanks, er, Colin yeah. Higgins is more like a, a sword in the th in this side. In this, like, so he's just thing. annoying. Right. It's, he, he'll always come in and be like, you can't shoot in New York and you can't do this and can't do that and blah, blah, blah. And he'll be like really mean to Robert Evans, but he's definitely not the main antagonist. Is he also a TV executive? Yeah, he, he's the person who tells uh, Robert Evans what to do, basically. When I read his name, I was like, Lapidus, where have I? And then I realized in episodes, the series with Matt LeBlanc, mm -hmm. they also had a TV executive who was really annoying <laughs> named like Merc Lapidus. Is something. that the person that ended up like dating like bugs? two women and then didn't tell them that he was dating them and he married one and then <laughs> it was, yeah he had his own and the funny thing is the character he based it off was like real people that he had no, met in the industry. No. Um, true or false? The Godfather Part Four was ultimately canceled because of negative reception of Part Three. Uh, true. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. Wait. They were going to make a fourth one. Nineteen ninety nine. They talked about it. <laughs> How? Oh, okay. And they That's... were like. Eh. <laughs> Uh, along with writing The Godfather and helping adapt it, Mario Puzo would also write what superhero films? What superhero films? Yeah. Think about it. Films. Era. Okay, what era 70s. of time? Oh, Superman? Yeah. Really? Yep. He worked <laughs> on the Superman. Because he's, he's portrayed at the very beginning of the first episode as like a failed author. Mm -hmm. Like no one. Well, is... now now I want you to get into the plot a little bit. Well, Tell I... me about these first three episodes. Well, I kind of want to get go through my pros and cons first. The best I, and worst. Yeah, what well, yeah. you liked and what you didn't. Yeah, you can go do it that way too. So yeah. yeah, so my first pro, and I think it's the highest compliment I can give the show, is that every single scene in this, uh, in all three episodes, 
could be in a film just in progress. Sure, there's like cliffhangers and they get resolved within like the next scene of each other. But overall, like, you know how TV kind of has that, um, has like less of a budget, even yes. for shows that try to be cinematic like Daredevil and, and all those other things. Here, it's like, no, this felt like I was like at the movie theater just watching these films. The colors were vibrant, the way that it was shot, like the cinematography, I was like, yes, this this works very well. Do you think that comes down to editing or the cinematography or the directing I think or it, what? I think it comes down to just, yeah, like talent. So probably directing. And, and the acting. Yeah, and acting. It also, it had, you know, obviously film people too yeah, many Marvel. actors yeah. and, and <laughs> like to keep list them well, i just wrote them down after a while but i usually like to go over the top names and it's just like with this there's just too my, many miles teller is the main character the last thing i'd seen him in was 21 and over film that came out in 2013 it was like really really bad so seeing and how him, similar is that character <laughs> is to this completely, one completely <laughs> completely different uh also just a way better character and uh i you know the acting's great like yeah. I, you, know. you heard there was some background uh yeah. in production with him getting covid and well like, i think it's like yeah a debated topic because like he was tweeting out that like he didn't that didn't actually happen but there's like conflicting reports yeah. so it's like um with uh, mandalorian where whether or not pedro pascal had an issue with his helmet exactly uh-huh. yeah and, and i think that this is honestly a show that's a love letter to uh, people like the godfather people like behind the scenes but also just people that like film and i think that that is very different from something like the academy awards which you know the academy awards loves nominating uh films about the making of films, La La Land. such as like Mank or something like that, you know. Yes. But like, I feel like the audience or normal audiences don't actually enjoy those type of movies because they're very long and can sometimes be drawn out. Here, it's like, no, I think that this was able to grab your attention. And I think that anyone who actually likes film or wants to go into it should watch it. That being said, The Godfather is mandatory viewing. This is something you have to see the first movie for to really understand. Would it ruin it if you hadn't? Yes, it it, it would. (laughs) And also, even if you had seen The Godfather and it's been a couple years ago, I would still recommend before seeing this, if you're interested, skipping through through it, the actual film. Yeah, it's rewatchable. Yeah, oh yeah. (laughs) It's a rewatchable (laughs) film, so why not? Um, And it makes you want to do research on all of the stuff that happened afterwards because there's just some crazy stuff that I'm sure is actually true, but you almost can't believe it. Well, don't be so sure that it's actually true because, again, with s- certain details, they have a lot of artistic liberty, you know, in Hollywood. Yeah, but like for example, in the in the um, TV show, Albert Ruddy, he is almost kind of abducted a little bit by the uh, mafia. And He's almost then, abducted. Well, he he gets a gun drawn on him, and then they're like, "Get in the car." So oh. he gets in the car. This is in the third episode. He drives to Joe Colombo, who is like kind of the main leader of the mafia. He's like the Corleone guy, right? He's like the main Corleone. <laughs> exactly, and then Albert Ruddy is. Like, like, um, hey, look, I'm not trying to make like a bad film. I'm not trying to paint the Italians in a bad light. How about you come over to the studio and read the script so you know I'm telling the truth? And apparently that actually happened. So like, I mean, you know, that's that's crazy. That's crazy in the end that someone got abducted and then they still had like the balls to be like, hey, hey, look, I want you to come over to Paramount Pictures t- talking to like the uh, mafia and, and actually have them read the script. But that's so. somewhat well known in the industry that like the Godfather had the mafia looking over its shoulders oh, yeah. during the creation of it. So doesn't that lead a lot of people who've already heard that story, wanted to see portrayed almost perfectly? Otherwise, they're going to be highly critical of it. Like, well, are, are you at all afraid that people turned an, uh, on this uh, show and were like, we're going to look through this with a microscope and make sure that the details are right? Uh, well, I feel like the show's doing that already. I feel like it, like down to the detail, at least from what, everything I've heard about the film being made anyways. And that's another one of my positives. The fact that I heard so much about the show and was able to actually see it uh, portrayed on screen. Mm-hmm. Like uh, Bloodhorn, I think that's the way you say uh, his name. He's the guy who was played oh, yeah. in, um, in Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones, Halo. Uh, he was the one person I said I recognized there, The Dark Knight Rises. But yeah, I, like, I've like i known through it forever. Pacific Rim. The, the Bloodhorn guy, yeah, exactly. He was like a real big heart ass and like he wanted things done his way and he in that character is played exactly the way that i always <laughs> thought that he would be uh, so typecast almost exactly for that role yeah but but it worked perfectly uh there's a, really only a couple cons one is that the plot moves so fast that you have to be paying attention herky jerky uh herky jerky but like it the like thing timeline is, wise, I heard that the they skip you around a lot. Yeah, because yeah. it's nineteen sixty-five so you have to, to nineteen seventy-two-ish. Yeah, if you're gonna be watching like an episode of this, no matter what episode, it's not like you can do homework or be on your phone to the side. You have to like be really paying attention to what's going on. Um, and then also my main thing was the mafia storyline. That was my main con. In the third episode, it makes more sense as to why it happened because that's when the storylines actually intersect. 
but I mean, uh, beforehand, it was really repetitive. And I brought up Scarface before, and the reason I did that is because um, I think it's a story where in the 1930s, two gangsters, because obviously Scarface was based on Al Capone, um, who what? worked for Al Capone, yeah, yeah. went into Howard Hawks' uh, house and yeah. were like, hey, we heard that you're making a film about our boss. And then he was like, oh, no, I'm not. And then they leave. Difference here is that Howard uh, Al Capone ended up loving Scarface in the 1930s. And obviously, the Italians hated as we see in the show, the book, and the movie. Hmm. It's it's ironic to me that, like, with things like Argo, uh, where they go into, like, a war-torn country where that's, like, just on the precipice of, like, some terrible stuff going down, the only way they get in and out is pretending to be filmmakers. <laughs> right. So, exactly. like, things like this is the opposite. It's like you find out that they're shooting a film and you get angry at them mm-hmm. as opposed to the alternative. Yeah, and you said what's, well, like, I said winning time because uh, kind of, it, this is a little bit before winning time, but like, obviously decades ago, BoJack Horseman, Mad Men, just because it has to BoJack both, Horseman. Deal with, they both deal with films and actors and, and like, a kind it's of... An inner reflection on people in the industry talking right. about people in the industry and there's a that. and once upon a time in hollywood perfect because of the party scenes there's a lot of party scenes in the first episode that feel like quentin tarantino just came in to direct those scenes in general would because, dicaprio fit in with this cast because he's seems played like that time yeah. period before yeah. yeah it seems like it um mink like i said behind the scenes but obviously that's for citizen what Kane. about disaster artist Disaster Artist you could also bring in there, yeah. Because Cause that's the most recent film I could think of that really took a took the making of another film. In this case, yeah. it goes from the best film... <laughs> to, to the worst film. <laughs> Citizen <laughs> Kane of the worst, worst films. films, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, I've said the Wait, Eddie... Citizen Kane. The Citizen Kane of, of bad films. That's oh, what the they call okay, yeah. yeah. And then the Eddie I was surprised to pull out from all from our like second <laughs> podcast that we ever did, but that's because of I the Mafia storyline. Yeah. Um, I remember I didn't like how like the Mafia storyline fit in with the whole entire bar scene. Yeah, he's a jazz pianist, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. and then here it felt like the same thing because, again, it was so just kind of repetitive for those first two stories. Because their main story for the first two episodes yep. is uh, we don't like that this thing is being made. Obviously, The Godfather is racist. Let's try to end production however we can. But that's literally all they try to do for the first two episodes. One of the criticisms I've heard is that it resolves anything that becomes an issue rather quickly. Well, that's what I was talking about. They do end with cliffhangers, but like the next scene is um is them wrapping it up. But that's why I said, how many episodes is this supposed to be? Ten. Ten. That's why I feel like this is more just kind of like a ten hour film rather than a TV series that they just decided to kind of cut up into parts. Do you think they could have trimmed the fat and made it into a movie? No, I think that there's too much to be said. Maybe if they maybe if they made it, I don't know how the series is going to structure itself, but maybe if they did like one movie for The Godfather, Godfather the first one, mm-hmm. then a second one for The Godfather Part 2 and Godfather Part 3, third movie. Maybe if they did something like that. I think it's a mini series. I think it's just going to stick to this season. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. That's... Especially since Albert S. Ruddy wasn't part of the second oh, is he not? or the third one no okay well, but the second one is like considered i thought the second one was considered just as good as the first one but i don't know the second godfather yeah better it's considered better, better. yeah the funny thing about the t- uh, tagline for this thing is like the greatest movie almost never made and i think they refer to it as the greatest movie in the show at yeah. some point um, oh no throughout, which is throughout, funny yeah. because like yeah it's not even considered the best of the franchise if you look at it but i think you're gonna find this very interesting so it has an 8.3 on IMDb. Actually, I should, damn it, I should have asked your, uh, what, what do you give it? Oh, no, I, oh, well, I would give it, like, probably a 9. You give it a 9. I give it a 9. So you'd recommend it, you love the show. Yeah, no, I think that people should watch you it. You fall into the camp of people who are just like, absolutely. Maybe, maybe if you are someone who doesn't like The Godfather. I like the way you put it before, that you need to have seen The Godfather. You need, this is a love letter to, or a fan letter to fans. Right, yeah. But, I, but it, it has such a big fan base that I think it also, it's just uh, kind of feeding in and of itself that it was able to be kind of a success, at least in my eyes. All right, and have you gone through all your pros and cons? Yeah, for the most part, yeah. There's a lot of references also that they make like um i'm not sure that's that's part of the reason why i want to kind of do research as to what's true and what's false because um they like talk about cannolis a lot and cannolis is like a main food that they eat in the godfather i know in the film Very Italian. yeah in the film they also have to fly to vegas and in the show they fly to vegas to try and see if they can uh get someone to do a part for the film do they eat spaghetti in the godfather I'm sure they do at some point. It's been so long <laughs> since I've seen the movie. I don't remember. I, I'm sure they do at some point. All right. But yeah, uh, yeah, but that's basically all my pros and cons. All right. So we kind of talked about, yeah, it has an 8.3 on IMDb. The uh, user reviews are glowing. They're like what you're saying, mm-hmm. right? It has a 43% on Rotten Tomatoes. I was wondering that because I saw right before, I think a couple weeks ago that like the reviews came out pretty early and it had like a 50% on Rotten Tomatoes. And I was like, well, that's strange. Yeah. So here's on the other side of the thing. All the critics seem to hate this show. 
Like I everyone, wonder why. It's they take the low hanging fruit in their headlines, <laughs> which is funny because they like all go for the cheap pun. You know, mm -hmm. AV Club says. The offer sleeps with the fishes. Vox says, a TV show about how great movies are. Um, that doesn't sound neg negative, but it was a yeah, negative right. review. Roger Ebert said, the offer can't sell Godfather making of. Rolling Stone, the offer is the Godfather origin story you 100% can refuse. Vulture said, the offer's self-congratulation underserves the Godfather. NPR says, the offer's a self-indulgent chronicle of making of the Godfather. Decider says, it's a bloated miniseries detailing the making of the Godfather. Bloated. Okay, so yeah, there there are a lot of different storylines that like uh, seem kind of complex or a little convoluted in there, but I, I don't agree with those. And this I think this is the first show that I'm probably saying that I'm going to watch the rest of the series for that has gone like a Ron on Rotten Tomatoes or hmm. something like that. So the Wayne Time has a positive review on Rotten Tomatoes? I think so, yeah. All right, yeah. It, the, the main criticisms here when you read through the articles is that it's cheesy. Cheesy? Yeah. Like the, I mean, it's kind of supposed to be. It's taking place in the 70s. It's There's exaggeration with the acting, but mostly with the plot. This, that um, they simply fix almost every problem that they come across. Albert S. Ruddy is presented as the like the hero of all heroes. Yeah, yeah. Like he's too much of a, a, a good guy. I can see that. But it's herky jerky, like you said, and that the artistic license. It, it, what's funny to me, sorry, I just want to make this point. There are so many movies and TV shows that get acclaimed. Yeah. For, Imitation Game 42. I talked about this on the Gaslit yeah. <laughs> podcast. They, they're like so flimsy with the truth, the plot becomes all about the storyline that they're just making up the yeah. narrative that they want to show but hollywood for the most part usually doesn't care they're usually able to eat it up and credit the actors and the filmmakers and the production crew but when it's turned on them suddenly <laughs> they become the biggest scientist to <laughs> making sure that the truth is presented the right way it almost makes me laugh that i see an 8.3 on imdb and i'm like people are super enjoying this there is an audience here for this show mm -hmm. there's not usually an audience there before the show comes out usually the trailer drops and people are like ugh right but well for a lot of shows <laughs> but for this it was like a ton of people were on board and so it's just funny to me that that uh, the reviewers are going so hard at this one, especially when someone like you who's just seen the movie, who likes film, loves the show and doesn't really care that there's a good portion of it that is exaggerated. Yeah, no, I, well, and I, I wonder how much of it is exaggerated because when like you hear, you, when you see the actors, they got someone to play Al Pacino and I'm wondering what they're going to do with Marlon Brando. We haven't seen him portrayed in the- You haven't seen in, Marlon Brando Yeah, yet? we haven't seen him yet. They've mentioned him a couple times, but He's like Al Pacino that. sounds like Al Pacino. Francis Ford Coppola, I haven't heard how he speaks, but I'm sure Dan Fogel <laughs> is like doing probably the exact same thing. So Fogler? Like, yeah, Fogler. And then like, like I was saying, Bloodhorn, like- Frank Sinatra was in there, right, too? <laughs> Frank Sinatra, yeah. Yeah, he reminded me a little bit, and this isn't, it's definitely not as bad as that, but kind of Carlton from uh, <laughs> Bel Air, because obviously... The every, new Bel Air or the old the, one? the new Bel Air, because everything I've always heard about Frank Sinatra, I like his music, and, I, and I've heard he's always kind of been a nice guy, but here they... they treat I've him. Not, not heard that he's always been a nice guy. The later half of his career, I heard he was a tool. Well, yeah, I mean, here he's working with the mafia to try and shut down the Godfather. Yeah, just, he was not friends with the, uh, with the writer <laughs> at all. So, I mean, I think that the base element are true but a lot of the interviews that were used took place over the last couple of years and i think that the michael tolkien deserves a little bit of backlash for just trusting the word of the first executive yeah. producer he talks to and not <laughs> going and talking to coppola at all the yeah. guy who worked on all three films <laughs> well yeah i feel like the one thing that the last dance did and i'm bringing it up is because they were able to get interviews with every single person no matter maybe well how this isn't a documentary hard. if it's, this was a documentary it'd be completely different no i understand but like you're saying i feel like he maybe he could have gone maybe a little bit deeper that being said i feel like you were talking about how they were like every problem is simply fixed well that's kind of the point as to why the show was being made the first three episodes they run into a ton of different problems and yeah sure some are solved in the end but it's trying to show you how far the Godfather had to go. To I agree be made. because if all the odds are stacked against them, right. but you already know the film's been made, it, you would be you'd be like, well, what the heck? Yeah, I, I know the ending here. There's no way and it's going to end that way. So it's kind of good just to show every single problem pop up and then get solved. Like it'd be different if it was we crashed because we crashed. There's so many avenues to which a company can fail. Right. Yeah. When you tell the story to someone who doesn't know it. You can lead them down whatever path for as long as you want. Yeah. But with this, it's like, let's get as many different situations in there as possible. 
and just show from everybody's point of view. But the, but the criticism that does sound like it rings true is the fact that he's in Albert S. Ruddy is in the middle of everything. And it's like, there's um, no way he could have possibly been in the yeah. middle of everything. Yeah. You know, cause again, he is the, he is the main character. He is the person pushing uh, like probably the hardest for it to be made. I, I think that it, does he have a negative? Does, is there a flaw to him at all? Not really. Is it like no. King Richard where he's, yeah. he's ultimately a good person? <laughs> yeah. But like, <laughs> so so really so it really is is the critics because I thought that this was going to be something that was going to be going for to, like it Emmys. got three stars in the Guardian which most shows get two stars on the Guardian so I, <laughs> I mean, mean but at I thought, least there's a positive it seemed like they were good, that they were going for Emmys you don't cast these type of people and do this type of like big story without yeah I'm sure doing they're that. disappointed by the critical score but what's interesting about Paramount though is that. It doesn't even own, I don't think, the rights to the Godfather dispersal right now, like distribution. <laughs> I think that Amazon, when they bought MGM, if I remember correctly, maybe I'm completely off base, but I think they own the rights of the Godfather movies now. So I I don't know if, if they, like, it's weird how they're making this show about the creation of it where they're in the title they're paramount plus produced this and then they're also in the show yeah but did did, did did they have to come to some type of deal do you know well i think over time it's just been like i think amc bought it and then like mgm that's under something maybe i'm just off or maybe i'm wrong <laughs> if i'm completely off base i'll delete it from the podcast no problem <laughs> um is there anything else though that we should say about these three episodes how about um juno temple because i didn't she's been in a ton of stuff is uh, Juno betty, temple betty yeah yeah um what? I was just gonna say that she she's always someone who's able to like fix any problem she sees. Like she comes in, she's an assistant that like I feel like is almost godlike because it's like Albert comes to her with a problem and she's able to fix it just kind of like that with the snap of her fingers. Yeah. They also cast Robert Redford, the guy from Game Night, Billy Magnuson, I think is his name. Um, the guy wait, from the... Black Mirror as well. Yeah, he he's in it. He's playing Robert Redford because uh, wait, wait wait which guy from Black Mirror? Black Mirror and Game Night. Get Shorty. You, he was also yeah, in Get Shorty, which yeah, is yeah, also yeah. a little bit like this because they're like <laughs> about the creation of a movie. Yeah, I know. And that's it? also about the mafia. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> does he does he play Robert Rudford well? Yeah, he, well, we only see him in one scene. The reason why that happens is because um it was Albert Ruddy's real chance to show that he could do film. And um one thing that you learn in this show is that no matter what, um Paramount was always concerned with trying to get the right actors. Mm -hmm. Um and and therefore Albert Ruddy is able to get Robert Redford, but the film ends up like bombing at the box That's right. office. That's right. right, yeah. And then the reason Marlon Brando is like brought up in episode two because um Mario Puzo and uh, Francis Ford Coppola are talking about how they how he would be like the perfect person to play the main grandfather, and then by the end of the third episode, he uh, we get a letter and he's apparently interested in it. <laughs> how fun is it synopsizing <laughs> three hours worth of television into like it's, a it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode. Hope you enjoyed this one. Bye. Bye. Bye.